In this lecture, we shall discuss the amendment of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. We shall discuss the amendment of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. Now, the first thing that we must point out in the, this discussion is that when we discussed the classifications of a constitution, we identify that the constitution of Ghana is one that would pass as a rigid constitution. This is because the amendment of the 1992 constitution of Ghana requ requires a special amendment procedure for its amendments. And so in this lecture, what we shall seek to identify and establish are one, which provisions in the constitution can be amended? Number two, who has the power and responsibility when it comes to the amendment of the constitution? Number three, we shall also seek to discuss the procedure for amending the constitution. And under this heading, we shall draw a distinction between amendment of the entrenched provisions in the constitution and also amendment of the non-entrenched provisions of the constitution. When we have explained the different modes of amending the entrenched and non-entrained provisions of the constitution, we shall finally examine the case of Asari number no. two versus the attorney general. Number no. two, reported in 2015, 2016, two Supreme Court of Ghana law reports at page 899. And then in that case, we would interrogate and find out that if the president plays a rule by forming a commission of inquiry, by forming the constitutional review committee, if they form these things that play a role or to give some recommendations about provisions in the constitution that are supposed to be amended, we'll see whether the president playing that rule is an affront to separation of powers or is an interference with the work of parliament. So we'll examine the case of Asari number two versus the Attorney General number two, reported in 2015, 2016, two Supreme Court of Ghana law reports at page 899. So the first thing we shall discuss before even proceeding with the discussion on amendments is to point out, as I've indicated, that the constitution of Ghana is one that is rigid. And so it requires a special amendment procedure for its amendments. Now, there are two key provisions in the constitution I must draw to your attention. If we have to fully discuss the amendment process of one of the constitution of Ghana. These provisions are chapter 25 of the 1992 constitution, which is headed amendment of the constitution. And then we shall also look at article 298 of the constitution. These are two key provisions that are very helpful in the discussion of amendment of the 1992 constitution. As I've indicated, article 298 of the constitution as well as chapter 25 of the constitution. So let me begin by pointing out what we have under Article 298 of the Constitution. I shall quote expressly from the Constitution and then explain the import of that provision. Now, for those of you who have the Constitution, if you take a look at Article 298 in the side notes, you see over there that it's been described as the residual powers of parliament. Residual powers of parliament. So Article 298 reads as follows, and I quote, 
subject to the provisions of chapter 25 of this constitution, where on any matter, whether arising out of this constitution or otherwise, there is no provision express or by necessary implication of this constitution which deals with the matter that has arisen, parliament shall by an act of parliament not being inconsistent with any provision of this constitution provide for that matter to be dealt with. In the quote ends. Now, what this is necessarily saying is that if you have any provision in the constitution and then there's a matter that comes up and it realizes that the provisions in the constitution, there's no provision that has been enacted to deal with that particular matter. And there's a need for a provision to be enacted to deal with it. Parliament has been given the power under Article 298 of the constitution to enact a law to fill in that gap or that lacuna that exists in the law. Because you see, no matter how much the framers of the constitution may have been very wise in their superior wisdom, it, it may not be possible for them to look at all of the nice things that can happen in human society to enact laws to deal with them. And if it happens that there was an omission or there's a lacuna, there's a gap anyway, parliament has been given the power under Article 298 to fill that gap. And this is what we call the residual powers of parliament. They have been given the power to enact a law to deal with the matter that there's no provision in this constitution that has been enacted to deal with it. Having dealt with Article 298, remember I mentioned that the two key provisions that shall form the foundation of our discussion are Article 298 and Chapter 25 of the Constitution. And Article 298 is what we have just dealt with that deals with the residual powers of Parliament. Now, let us delve into Chapter 25, which is the main foundation for the amendment of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. Now, if anybody reads at chapter 25 of the Constitution, one point that becomes very, very clear is that there are elaborate and cumbersome procedures that may even come at a great expense to the government whenever we have to amend a provision of the Constitution. And therefore, if you have any doubts that the Constitution of Ghana is one that you can describe as a rigid Constitution at this point, all doubt should be cleared that by virtue of the procedure, the robust procedure that we have under Article under Chapter 25, we can describe the 1992 Constitution as a rigid Constitution. Before we begin with the discussion of the amendment of the Constitution, as provided for under Chapter 25, there are three critical points I must bring to your attention before we begin to dissect the provisions in Chapter 25. These three points are very important, they are very crucial, and you must all pay critical attention to these three points. The first one that you must note is that as far as the 1992 Constitution is concerned, every provision in the Constitution is capable of being amended, with the exception of some three provisions in the Constitution that are not capable of being amended. Every provision in the Constitution can be amended with the exception of some three provisions in the Constitution. Those three provisions cannot be amended, even though they are in the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. And these three provisions are sections 34, sections 35, and sections 37 of the transitional provisions of the 1992 Constitution. And let me explain why I'm saying this. If you take a look at the 1992 Constitution of Ghana, there is a first schedule to the Constitution getting at the end. So when you finish your articles, there's a first schedule. That's where you have the transitional provisions. Now, when you go there, look at section 37, which is the last section of the transitional provisions. And this is what it says, and I quote, Notwithstanding anything in Chapter 25 of this Constitution, Parliament shall have no power to amend this section or sections 34 and 35 
of this schedule and the quote ends. I'm repeating it. Notwithstanding anything in chapter 25 of this constitution, parliament shall have no power to amend this section or section 34 and 35 of this schedule. And the quote ends. And that is why I'm saying that we need to point this out to you before we even begin on the discussion of the amendment. That even though we have chapter 25 dealing with amendments, I want you to know that there are some provisions that no matter who you are, no matter where you're coming from, you cannot amend those provisions in the constitution. And there are section 34, 35, and 37 of the transitional provisions of the 1992 constitution. That's the first preliminary point. The second point that we must point out before we begin our discussion is that in the 1992 constitution of Ghana, the only body that has been given the authority, the mandate, the power to amend the constitution is the parliament of Ghana. Parliament of Ghana is the only body that has been given the exclusive power to amend provisions contained in the 1992 constitution of Ghana. The executive, the legislature, they do not have any power to amend any provision in the constitution. And I will demonstrate this to you by referring to Article 289 plus 1 of the 1992 Constitution. Article 289 plus 1 of the 1992 Constitution. And this is what it says. And I quote, Subject to the provisions of this Constitution, Parliament may, by an act of Parliament, amend any provision of this Constitution. Again, subject to the provisions of this Constitution, Parliament may, by an act of parliament, amend any provision of this constitution. And so that point is also key to note because if we begin with our discussion of the amendment, we will not look any further. We will only look at the provisions that relates to parliament and how they can amend the constitution. And then also important to note is the provision of Article 289 Clause 2. We make it clear that before anything can be deemed to have amended the constitution, the act must have been passed solely for the purpose of amending the constitution. Before any act can be deemed to have amended the constitution, then the act must have been passed solely for the purpose of amending the constitution. In other words, you cannot read an implied amendment. You can't say that, oh, when you read this enactment, it appears that it is impliedly amending this provision of the constitution. We will not entertain the argument. The question would be, was this an act that has been passed for the sole purpose of amending the constitution and has it been passed in a corner with chapter 25? If yes, then it can amend it. And you see this point under article 289 clause two, which reads as follows, and I quote, the con this constitution shall not be amended by an act of parliament or altered, whether directly or indirectly, Unless A, the sole purpose of the act is to amend this constitution, and B, the act has been passed in accordance with this chapter. And the quote ends. So before any act can be deemed to have amended the constitution, that act must have been passed for the sole purpose of amending the constitution. And the act must have been passed in accordance with chapter 25 of the constitution. So three key points we need to move before we begin with our discussion. First point is that the, every provision in the constitution can be amended with the exception of section 34, 35, and 37 of the transitional provisions which are contained in the first schedule of the 1992 constitution. The number two, the only body or organ of state that is given the power and mandates to amend the constitution is the parliament of Ghana. And you see this under article 289, was one. And finally, there is nothing like an implied amendment of any constitutional provision. Before any act can be deemed to have amended the constitution, that act must have been passed specifically for the sole purpose of amending the constitution. And it must be passed in accordance with chapter 25 of the 1992 constitution of Ghana. This is the foundation on which we can now begin with our discussion on the amendment of the constitution. Now, as I indicated in the introduction, we shall 
separate the discussion of the amendment into two main categories, amendment of entrenched provisions and amendment of non-entrenched provisions. So we shall begin with amendment of entrenched provisions of the 1992 constitution of Ghana. So when we say amendment of entrenched provisions, what provisions in the constitution can we describe as entrenched? What provisions in the constitution can we describe as entrenched provisions? The answer to this is found under Article 290 of the Constitution. Article 290 of the Constitution reads as follows. It lists about 19 different chapters of the Constitution and where you can have entrenched provisions. So, Article 290 of the Constitution, it reads as follows, and I quote, this article applies to the amendment of the following provisions of the Constitution, which are in this Constitution referred to as entrenched provisions. A, the Constitution, Articles 1, 2, and 3. B, the Territories of Ghana, Articles 4 and 5. C, the Laws of Ghana, Article 11. D, Fundamental Human Rights and Freedoms, Chapter 5. E, Representation of the People, Article 42, 43, 46, 49, 55, and 56 of the Constitution. F, The Executive, Chapter 8. G, The Legislator, Article 93 and 106. H, the judiciary, articles 125, 127, 129, 145, and 146 of the Constitution. I, freedom and independence of the media, article 162, plus 1 to 5. J, finance, article 174 and 187. Police service, article 200. L, the Armed Forces of Ghana, Article 210. Then we have Commission of Human Rights and Administrative Justice, Articles 216 and 225. We also have National Commission for Civic Education, Article 231. We also have Decentralization and Local Governments, Article 240 and 252. We also have Chief Tenancy, and that's under Article 270. Then we have Code of Conduct for Public Officers, Article 286. And we have Amendment of the Constitution, Chapter 25. And finally, Miscellaneous, Articles 293 and 299 of the Constitution. So these provisions are what we can refer to as entrenched provisions of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. And we can find the full list under Article 290, of the constitution. Now, what is the procedure for amending the entrenched provisions of the constitution? Now, you remember that under article 289 of the constitution, we have already mentioned that the amendment of the constitution is supposed to be done by parliament, by an act of parliament. Remember that one, that under Article 289 Clause 1, the amendment of the Constitution is to be done by Parliament and they must do so by an act of Parliament. So now how do we amend the entrenched provisions of the Constitution? Now you can refer to Article 290 Clause 2 of the Constitution. Now Article 290 Clause 2 of the Constitution reads as follows. And I quote, a bill for the amendment of an entrenched provision shall, before Parliament proceeds to consider it, be referred by the Speaker to the Council of States for its advice. And the Council of States shall render advice on the bill within 30 days after receiving it. I'll take it again. Article 290 Clause 2 of the Constitution. A bill for the amendment of an entrenched provision so before Parliament proceeds to consider it, be referred by the Speaker to the Council of States for its advice, 
and the Council of State shall render advice on the bill within 30 days after receiving it. And the quote ends. So what do we get from Article 290 plus 2? It means that, first of all, before we can amend the Constitution or an entrenched provision of the Constitution, there must be a bill. Why must there be a bill? Because we have already mentioned under Article 289 plus 1 that the only way the Constitution can be amended is through an Act of Parliament. By now, you already know under Article 106 of the 1992 Constitution that the power of Parliament to make laws shall be exercised by bills passed by Parliament and assented to by the President. Under Article 106, that the power of Parliament to make laws shall be exercised by bills passed by Parliament and assented to by the President. So if the Constitution says that the power of Parliament to amend the Constitution shall be by an act of Parliament, then it means that there must definitely be a bill. Let's go back to Article 219 plus 2. It says, a bill for the amendment of an entrenched provision shall, before Parliament proceeds to consider it, be referred by the Speaker to the Council of States for its advice, and the Council of States shall render advice on the bill within 30 days after receiving it. And the quote ends. This is what we can draw from Article 290 plus 2. That first of all, if you want to amend an entrenched provision, a bill for the amendment of the entrenched provision has to be tabled before Parliament. Then when it is tabled before Parliament, before Parliament will proceed to even consider it, the Speaker has to refer the bill to the Council of States. And the Council of States must consider the bill and then give its advice within 30 days after receiving the bill that has been referred to it by the Speaker of Parliament. So within 30 days after the Council of State has received the bill that has been referred to it from the Speaker of Parliament, the Council of State has to give its advice within 30 days. So the first stage for the amendment of the entrenched provision is that the bill must be tabled before Parliament. Then when the bill is tabled before Parliament, before Parliament even proceeds to consider the bill, it has to be referred by the Speaker of Parliament to the Council of State. And the Council of State must give the advice within 30 days. Now, at this point, let me just mention that the Constitution does not mention what will be the consequence if the Council of State fails to give its advice within the 30 days. But some scholars, notably Sir Kofi Komado, in his book, A Handbook of the Constitutional Law of Ghana and its History, has taken the view that if the Council of State advises against the bill, then it means that the bill shall not be proceeded with any further. And this point is made at page 464 of his book, titled A Handbook of the Constitutional Law of Ghana and its History, written by Sir Kofi Kumadu at page 464. And this is what the learned author says, and I quote, A bill for the amendment of an entrenched provision shall be A, tabled before Parliament. B, before Parliament considers the bill, it shall be referred to the Council of States, which has 30 days to consider it and advise. Though the Constitution does not say, the clear implication of this provision is that if the Council of States advises against it, the bill shall not proceed any further. And the quote ends. And so I'm saying that under authority of Article 290 Clause 2 of the Constitution, the first stage for amending an entrenched provision is that a bill for the amendment of the entrenched provision must be tabled before Parliament. When it is tabled before Parliament, the Speaker of Parliament must refer the bill to the Council of States, and they must give the advice within 30 days after receiving the bill. Now, when the Council of State gives the advice and that they say that we can go ahead with the amendment, what shall be the next stage? The bill would then have to be published in the gazettes. But 
it shall not be introduced into parliament unless six months have expired after the publication in the Gazette under this clause. So look at Article 290 Clause 3 of the Constitution. It says that the bill shall be published in the Gazette, but shall not be introduced into Parliament until the expiry of six months after the publication in the Gazette under this clause. Now, after the expiration of the six months, the bill can now be introduced in Parliament. So let us go over the steps so far. First is that there must be a bill that has to be tabled before Parliament. Before Parliament shall consider the bill, they shall refer to the Council of State who has to give the advice within 30 days. The bill must be published in the Gazette. And before this bill will be introduced in Parliament, then six months must have expired after the bill was published in the Gazette. Now, when the six months expires, what is the next thing that has to be done? Our answer is under Article 290, Clause 4 of the Constitution. And this is what it says. That after the bill has been read the first time in Parliament, it shall not be proceeded with further unless it has been submitted to a referendum held throughout Ghana and at least 40% of the persons entitled to vote voted at the referendum and at least 75% of the persons who voted cast their votes in favor of the passing of the bill. I'll take it again. After the bill has been read the first time in Parliament, it shall not be proceeded with further unless it has been submitted to a referendum held throughout Ghana and at least 40% of the persons entitled to vote voted at the referendum and at least 75% of the persons who voted cast their votes in favor of the passing of the bill. The quote ends. What does this mean? It means that upon the expiration of the six months after the bill has been published in the Gazette, we can now come and have the first reading in Parliament. But even when you read the, for the first time in Parliament, don't proceed with the bill unless you have referred and submitted the bill to a referendum, and the referendum must be held throughout the whole country. And the interesting point is that at this referendum, how many people must show up and vote? The law says that at least 40% of persons entitled to vote must show up. And when they show up to vote, 75% of those 40% must support the proposed amendment. This is the import of Article 290, Clause 4 of the Constitution. And so I'll read it again. Article 290, Clause 4 says that after the bill has been read the first time in Parliament, it shall not be proceeded with further unless it has been submitted to a referendum held throughout Ghana and at least 40% of the persons entitled to vote voted at the referendum and at least 75% of the persons who voted cast their votes in favor of the passing of the bill. The quote ends. So, so far, the steps are that one, the bill must be tabled before parliament. Before parliament will consider the bill, they shall refer it to the Council of State. The Council of State has 30 days to consider an advice for the bill. When they render the advice, the bill has to be published in the Gazette. But remember that the bill shall not be introduced into Parliament six, unless six months have expired after the publication in the Gazette. And also note that after the six months expires, then we shall not read it the first time in Parliament. And if you read it the first time in Parliament, the bill will then have to be submitted to a referendum. And the referendum for it to be valid, at least 40% of the registered voters must turn up and vote at the referendum. And then 75% of this 40% must support the proposed amendment. Now, after the bill has been approved at the referendum, the next point is answered under Article 290, Clause 5 of the Constitution. It says that where the bill is approved at the referendum, Parliament shall pass it. Parliament, you don't have an option. 
when the people of Ghana throughout the length and breadth of the country vote at the referendum to pass it, parliament shall pass it. And then finally, when parliament passes it, look at what Article 290 plus 6 says, that where a bill for the amendment of an entrenched provision has been passed by parliament, in accordance with this article, the president shall assent to it. President, so you don't have a choice. If the entire people of Ghana have voted and we say we amend it, what, what power do you have as president to say you don't, you don't approve of it? So please, after the bill has been submitted to the referendum, 40% of the persons entitled to vote must vote. And at least 75% of the persons who voted must cut their vote in favor of the passing of the bill. And then when the bill is approved at the referendum, parliament, you don't have an option, you must pass it. When one parliament passes it, then the president must also assent to the bill. And finally, look at Article 292 of the Constitution. It says that in the case of a bill, it says that, and I quote, Article 292 of the Constitution, a bill for the amendment of this Constitution, which has been passed by, which has been passed in accordance with this Constitution, it shall be assented to by the president only if, and then B, in the case of a bill to amend an entrenched provision, it is accompanied by a certificate from the Electoral Commission signed by the chairman of the Electoral Commission and bearing the seal of the commission that the bill was approved at a referendum in accordance with this chapter. Good end. It means that before the president shall assent to the bill, that is for the purpose of amending an entrenched provision, there must be a certificate emanating from the Electoral Commission. And this must be signed by the chairman of the Electoral Commission. And it must indicate that the bill was approved at a referendum conducted in accordance with Chapter 25 of the Constitution. These are the steps for amending the entrenched provision of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. Now we shall proceed to the amendment of the non-entrenched provision of 1992 Constitution. Amendment of non-entrenched provisions of the 1992 Constitution. And for this, the instructive article of the 92 Constitution we shall rely on is Article 291 of the 1992 Constitution. It lays down the procedure we must exhaust if we have to amend the non entrenched provisions of the 1992 Constitution. Article 291. And this is what it says. And I quote A bill to amend a provision of this Constitution, which is not an entrenched provision, shall not be introduced into Parliament unless A. It has been published twice in the Gazette, with the second publication being made at least three months after the first. And at least 10 days have passed after the second publication. This is what Article 291 plus 1 says. It says that, and I quote once again, a bill to amend a provision of this constitution, which is not an entrenched provision, shall not be introduced into parliament unless A, it has been published twice in the Gazette, with a second publication being made at least three months after the first, and at least 10 days have passed after the second publication. What does this mean? What this means is that if you want to amend a non-entrained provision, first of all, the bill, the bill for the amendment must be published twice in the Gazette. But when it is published twice in the Gazette, there must be an interval of at least three months between the first publication and the second publication in the Gazette. Now, let me read what the article says again. It says that unless it has been published twice in the Gazette, with the second publication being made at least three months after the first, 
What does this mean? It means that it must publish twice in the Gazette. Now, when you publish the first one, at least three months must pass before you publish it for the second time in the Gazette. That is when you can be deemed to have satisfied at go 291 plus 1A. And so, if you want to amend a non entrained provision of the Constitution, first step is that you must publish the bill in the Gazette twice. Now, when you publish the bill in the Gazette for the first time, the second publication must come at least three months after the first publication in the Gazette. And then also, the bill shall not be considered in Parliament until at least 10 days have passed since the second publication. So let me summarize this. That if you want to amend a non entrenched provision, first is that you must publish the bill for the first time in the Gazette. Then wait for at least three months, publish the bill again in the Gazette. But before the bill will be considered by Parliament, at least 10 days must pass after the second publication. That is the import of Article 291 plus 1 of the 1992 Constitution. Now, after this has been done, Article 291 clause 2 kicks in, and 291 clause 2 reads as follows. It says that the Speaker shall, after the first reading of the bill in Parliament, refer it to the Council of States for consideration and advice, and the Council of States shall render advice on the bill within 30 days after receiving it. Again, the Speaker shall, after the first reading of the bill in Parliament, refer it to the Council of States for consideration and advice, and the Council of States shall render advice on the bill within 30 days after receiving it. Now, what does this mean? It means that if you want to amend a non entrenched provision, your first step is that you must publish the bill in the Gazette, wait for three months, publish it for the second time, then wait for at least 10 days and then the bill shall not be considered in Parliament. Now, after the 10 days, when the bill is brought to Parliament and the first reading, after the first reading, the Speaker must submit the bill to the Council of State for consideration. And the Council of State shall have to give its advice on the bill within 30 days. Now, if the advice comes and they say, go ahead, then the bill shall be deemed to be approved if at the second and the third readings in Parliament, at least two thirds of the total membership of Parliament approve that the bill should be approved. And this is what you see under Article 291, Clause 3 of the Constitution. It says that while Parliament approved the bill, it may only be presented to the President for his assent if it was approved at the second and third readings of it in Parliament by the vote of at least two thirds of all members of Parliament. So what are the steps so far? First step is that there must be publication in the Gazette for the first time. Wait for three months, publish the bill in the Gazette for the second time. Then wait for 10 days. And then now it can be read in Parliament for the first time. When it is read in Parliament for the first time, what do you do? The speaker shall submit it to the Council of State for consideration. When it goes to the Council of State, how many days do they have? They have 30 days to advise on the bill. If the advice comes and they say, go ahead, then what happens? The bill has to go to the second and the third readings in Parliament. And the Constitution, Article 291, Clause 3, is saying that the bill shall be deemed to have been approved if at the second and third readings, Two thirds, at least two thirds of the total membership of parliament, they vote that the bill should be approved. Then, after the approval by the, at the second and third readings, what happens next? If you read Article 291, Clause 4, it says that where the bill has been passed in accordance with this article, the president shall assent to it. It means that when parliament at the second and the third readings, they approve of the bill by no less than two thirds majority they must now present it to the president and he must assent to the bill. So we can now walk through the steps 
for the amendment of the non-entrant provision. First, you must publish the bill in the Gazette, then wait for three months, publish the bill in the Gazette for the second time. Now, after the second publication, you must wait at least 10 days after the second publication. Then you cannot go for your first reading in Parliament. After the first reading in Parliament, the Speaker must refer it to the Council of State for the advice. And the Council of State must give the advice within 30 days. Now, if they give the advice within 30 days, and now the bill comes back to Parliament and is approved at the second and the third readings in Parliament by the vote of at least two thirds of total membership of Parliament, then the bill shall be deemed to be approved. Upon approval by Parliament, then they have to give it to the President and he shall ascend to it. These are the steps. But remember, very important is Article 292, Clause 1 A. It says that a bill for the amendment of this constitution, which has been passed in accordance with this constitution, shall be assented to by the president only if A, it is accompanied by a certificate from the speaker that the provisions of the constitution have been complied with in relation to the act. What this means is that if at the second and the third readings it is approved, before the president shall assent to it, the speaker must give a certificate to the president that the act was passed in accordance with the constitution, then the president shall not assent to it. So now let's walk through the full steps for the amendments of the non entrant provision of the constitution. First, is that is under Article 291. There must be a publication in the gazettes of the bill. After the first publication, you can wait for at least three months. Then you publish it in the gazette for the second time. After the second publication, you can't go ahead and consider it until at least 10 days have passed since the second publication. Now, after the expiration of that 10 days, now you can bring it to parliament for your first reading. Now, after the first reading in parliament, they shall not go into it, but the speaker would have to submit it to the Council of State for their advice. Now, the Council of State has 30 days to advise on the bill. Now, at this point, remember the word of Sir Kofi Kumadu, that if the advice from the Council of State is negative, then the bill shall proceed no further. But if it is positive, then the bill will come back to Parliament to go to second and third reading. And if you go to second and third reading, and at least two thirds majority of the members of Parliament approve it, then the bill shall be presented to the President for his assent. But before the President shall assent to it, the Speaker, and, and Article 292, must give a certificate that the provisions of the Constitution were complied with in relation to the law that has been passed. These are the steps for the passing of a bill to amend the non entrenched provisions of the Constitution. Now, one critical issue that has arisen is that if you look at Article 290 of the Constitution, it only says that Parliament may, by an Act of Parliament, amend any provision of the Constitution. Now, as to who must kickstart the, the process for compiling the views or the wishes of Ghanaians about what provisions they want to amend, as to who must kickstart that procedure, whether it is parliament, whether it is the executive, the constitution is silent on it. All the constitution says is that parliament, if you have to amend the constitution, you shall do it by an act of parliament. And this problem is very clear if you look at the happenings in Ghana sometime in around 2010. No, during that time, the president of Ghana actually went ahead to appoint a commission of inquiry. So the president of Ghana, being the head of the executive, he appointed a commission of inquiry. And the role of the commission of inquiry was to inquire into any matter of public interest. That's what commissions of inquiry do. So the president in 2010 appointed a nine-member 
constitutional review commission and their role, their function, their responsibility was to consider the advisability of the amendment to the 1992 constitution and that they should also provide a draft bill for possible amendments to the 1992 constitution. And so this nine member constitutional review commission, they were given the role and the responsibility to conduct a comprehensive review and then come out with a report on the possible amendments that can be made to the 1992 constitution. Now, this constitutional review commission was formed they went ahead, they did all that they could do, and then they presented a report. When this commission brought the report, the interesting thing is that the government of Ghana issued a white paper, and the government of Ghana accepted most of the recommendations made by this commission of inquiry. This constitutional review commission, the government of Ghana accepted the recommendations they made. It didn't end there. After the government of Ghana accepted the recommendations brought about by the Constitution Review Commission, in 2012, the government of Ghana went ahead to set up another body. This time around, it was a five-member Constitution Review and Implementation Committee. They set up another body, which will call a five-member Constitution Review and Implementation Committee, CRIC, their role was to implement the recommendations of the Constitution Review Commission. Don't be confused. There are two bodies over here. In 2010, the first body that was formed was a nine-member Constitution Review Commission. They were to consider the advisability of possible amendments to the 1992 Constitution, and they bring a draft bill for the possible amendments. Now, when they gave their report, the government of Ghana accepted their recommendations. So now to implement the recommendations, the government of Ghana in 2012 has set up another body, a five-member constitution review and implementation committee. Their role was to implement the recommendations of the constitution review commission. Now, remember that I've already mentioned to you that under article 289 of the constitution, the only body that has been given exclusive power when it comes to the amendment of the constitution is parliament. Meanwhile, the government of Ghana has taken steps to appoint a constitution review commission to consider the advisability of some amendments. They've gone ahead to also form a five-member constitution review and implementation committee. And their role was to implement the recommendations Meanwhile, we know under Article 289, the Parliament has been given exclusive mandates to use an Act of Parliament to amend any provision of the Constitution. So, in the case of Asari, number two, versus the Attorney General, number two, reported in 2015, 2016, two Supreme Court of Ghana law reports at page 899. Asari brought an action to the Supreme Court invoking the exclusive original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court under Article 2 and Article 130. And the essence of his action and government of his use was that he was challenging the constitutionality of the government sponsored amendments as far as the steps taken by the government for the amendment of the constitution is concerned. Now, what was the essence of Asari's case? So now in the suit at the Supreme Court, this is one of the reliefs that was being sought by Asari. And I quote, he was seeking a declaration that the Constitution Review Commission of Inquiry Instrument 2010, CI 64, is null void and of no effect as it contravenes the letter and spirit of article 289 clause 1 of the 1992 constitution in that the effect if not the intended purpose of ci 64 is to usurp 
powers that the Constitution of Ghana had expressly, exclusively, and specifically conferred to Parliament. Another declaration that he was seeking was that a declaration that the 1992 Constitution can be amended only in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 25 of the Constitution, and that the President's role in any such constitutional amendment is limited to ministerial tasks stipulated in Article 290 plus 6, 291 plus 4, and 292 plus A. Another relief was taken was this, and I quote, a declaration that the Constitution Review Implementation Committee set up by the President to finalize amendment bills for both the entrenched and non-entrenched provisions is alien to the Constitution and any and all of its intended activities directed at finalizing amendment bills that touch on any and all aspects of the Constitution, whether entrenched or non-entrenched, are unlawful, unconstitutional, impermissible, null, void, and of no effect. Now, these are the reliefs Asari is seeking before the Supreme Court. In this case of Asari number no. two versus the Attorney General, Number two, 2015, 2016, two Supreme Court of Ghana law reports at page 899. What is the essence of these reliefs? He's saying, in essence, that under Article 289 of the Constitution, the only body that has been given any role to perform, as far as the amendment of the Constitution is concerned, is Parliament. Article 289, Clause 1 says, Parliament may, by an act of Parliament, amend any provision of the Constitution. And so what business do you have as a president going ahead to form a commission, a constitutional review commission, that they should go ahead and compile views of the people of Ghana, then find out, and now you formed a constitution review implementation committee to implement the recommendations. As I was saying that this is a role that has been specifically reserved for the parliament under Article 289 Clause 1. And so he's saying that all that they have done in setting up the Constitution Review Commission and the Implementation Commission, they are no void and of no effect as being contrary to Article 289 Clause 1 of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. Now, the main issue for the court to decide was whether the president, by forming all of these bodies, had usurped the powers of parliament. Now, the Supreme Court, in a majority decision, five to two majority decision, dismissed the plaintiff's action. The Supreme Court held that the role that the president played in forming the Constitution Review Commission and also the Constitution Review and Implementation Committee, all these roles were roles that were pre-legislative. They were roles that were not legislative roles, but they were pre-legislative in the sense that they were roles that were antecedent to Parliament's power to now pass the bills and then amend the Constitution. And that even though Article 289 says that Parliament is the one that would amend the Constitution through acts of Parliament, the Constitution didn't indicate who has to introduce those bills to Parliament. It only says Parliament may by an act of Parliament amend any provision in the Constitution, but it doesn't show who is supposed to introduce that bill to Parliament. Now, if you remember, under Article 106, 107, 108 of the 9th Century Constitution, the executive has the power to introduce bills on behalf of to, to Parliament to introduce bills to Parliament. And so if the Constitution and Article 289 only says that Parliament shall amend the Constitution by an act of Parliament, and doesn't say that the executive does not have a role to play, then the general provision in the law that gives the executive the right to introduce bills that can subsequently become acts will still be applicable. So the Supreme Court in the majority decision held that whatever the president did was pre-legislative and that Parliament will still have to exercise its power under Chapter 25 before 
the bill will become law. And to support this provision, provision permit me to quote a portion of the dictum of Georgina Wood, CG, in this case of Asari and Attorney General. And this is what she says, and I quote. On the facts, I would not declare as unconstitutional the Constitution Review Commission of Inquiry Instrument 2010, CI 64, and the work executed thereunder. Based on the plaintiff's main charge and arguments that the CI 64 Avenue was misappropriated and effectively and deployed to usurp the powers that the 1992 Constitution expressly, exclusively, and specifically conferred to Parliament and to undo the carefully designed Chapter 25 architecture. This comes against the backdrop of my earlier finding that pre-legislative actions are not the exclusive preserve of Parliament, especially when I have not identified any evidence expressed or implied in support of these grave charges. No doubt the commission was entrusted with a national assignment of extreme importance and sacredness. The members appointed to this task, among other things per Article 278 Clause 3, were men and women of high moral character, this being the mandatory constitutional requirements. But in my respectful opinion, all these matters per se, plus the findings, recommendations, and indeed the work of the Constitution Review Implementation Committee, I have classified as pre-legislative only, do not place the work on a higher footing than what I have tried earlier to explain. The use of CI-64 did not and does not exempt the proposed amendments, draft bills from being taken to the full rigors of Chapter 25 laws. Neither does it usurp or whittle down Parliament's core legislative functions under Chapter 25. They remain valid and sacrosanct. The evidence available and all findings made and conclusions I have drawn in this action do not support the plaintiff's case. So at this point, so I'm, I'm, and that's where the quote ends. So at this point, Georgina Wood is saying that all that the president did in forming the Constitution Review Commission, the Constitution Review Implementation Committee, what they did was pre-legislative and the parliament still had its power preserved to go through whatever they had to do to pass an act to amend the constitution. So there was no unconstitutionality over here. Also very important to note is the dictum of Benin JSC in this same case of Asari and Attorney General. And this is what he says, and I quote, in my opinion, the framers of the constitution did not intend to curtail the president's rights to introduce bills into parliament under chapter 25 of the constitution. The reasons are not far to seek. Article 289 clause one gives the power to parliament to pass an act to effect a constitutional amendment. The constitution duly acknowledges that an act of parliament is not the first step in the process of amending the constitution. Article 290 clause two and article 291 clause one provide that a bill may be introduced into parliament proposing amendments to an entrenched and non-entrenched provision respectively before parliament may proceed with the process of amendment. Whilst the constitution is unequivocal in stating in Article 289, Clause 1, that only Parliament may pass an act to amend the Constitution, it is completely silent as regards who has the right to introduce an amendment bill to Parliament under Article 290, Clause 2 and 291, Clause 1 of the Constitution. In my opinion, the framers of the Constitution left this open and fluid so that Parliament should be able to receive an amendment bill from various sources, especially from the president, who in other parts of the constitution has that working relationship with parliament. And in such an important 
assignment or exercise which affects all the sovereign people of Ghana, it is not unreasonable that these provisions leave room for other groups or persons to make an input as part of the preparatory steps, including draft bills in the constitutional amendment process. If it was intended that any bill for amendment should only come from parliament itself, clear words to that effect would have been used in articles 290 clause 2 and 291 clause 1, just like in article 289 clause 1. And then this is where the quote ends. So what the majority in essence is saying in Asari and Attorney General is that all that the president did informing the Constitution Review Commission and the Implementation Committee, they did not take away the president, the parliament's power to amend the constitution by passing acts of parliament. And so whatever they did was not an affront to the constitution. And so the work of the Constitution Review Commission remained valid. So the reason why we are discussing this Asari and AG case is to demonstrate that even though the constitution indicates that it is only parliament that has the power, to amend the constitution by an act of parliament, please take note that the president can indeed play a role in compiling views to a commission of inquiry about what they think is necessary to be incorporated as an amendment. And when they do that, it will not amount to usurping parliament rules. And so this is the process that we can use in terms of amending the 1992 constitution of Ghana. It will be very interesting to read this full case because it discusses separation of powers as well to show whether what the president did was an affront to parliament's powers in terms of passing law. But for now, we will not delve into that particular aspect. So this is where we can wrap up with our discussion on amending the 1992 constitution of Ghana. We have discussed the provisions that can be amended, the ones which cannot be amended, the procedure for amending and trend provisions and the procedure for many non entrenched provisions. And we've discussed the case of Asari versus Attorney General, 2015 2016, two Supreme Court of Ghana law reports at page 899. And we've been able to understand the role that the president can also play in amending the Constitution. This is where we shall end our lecture. Thank you.